but Napoleon's desire to gain the confidence of the Bourbons, as was shown afterwards, and the Austrian marriage cannot be denied. He had respect and even veneration for monarchical principles, though he has denied it in writings of his captivity. From 1805 onwards, he continually strove to ally his house with the royal families of Europe and to get himself admitted into the society and household of kings. The times in which he lived, the education he had received, the influence exercised on his needy youth by the awful and beneficent monarchy all concurred in determining him when laying the foundations of a dynasty to seek to establish it without usurpation. The lot which he proposed for the Bourbons was surely preferable to the monastery in which Pepin the short imprisoned Childeric III or to the poison with which Hugh Capet murdered himself of Louis V. The only reason he had to regret the attempt was its failure in publication. He naturally had it denied diplomatically by Talleyrand, even as he denied it himself afterwards when he attempted to justify his fallen empire without going so far as to say that by virtually recognizing the superior claim of a house founded on divine right, he destroyed the democratic nature of the authority he had received from the nation. Still, it must be allowed that he was not content to base his throne solely on the popular choice. The tribunes and the Senate could propose the reestablishment of monarchical institutions. The people could be called to ratify this reestablishment with their votes recorded at the town halls and polling booths. But such proceedings were flat, plain, and uninspiring. They neither aroused the enthusiasm of the populace nor satisfied his own Latin imagination, which was too given to grandiose ideas and too hungry for magnificence not to be susceptible to the truly Roman desire for pomp and circumstance. Thus he was enabled to raise himself to legitimate kingship by simple election owing to his recognition or apparent recognition of the superior claim of the Bourbons. And he did not believe that the will of the sovereign people was sufficient to secure a dynasty which he dreamed of founding to endure through the centuries. Accordingly, he cast around him for a consecration and for ancestors. The latter were easier to obtain than the former, while secretly negotiating for the one, he busied himself in unearthing his long-lost forebears. Napoleon did not indeed fall into the same absurdity as his brothers in their eagerness to discover their princely descent. Though unable to trace his own lineage to the Carlovingians, he yet restored the cult of Charlemagne and paid honor to his memory. He wished to be held the successor of him, who, by filling the world with his fame, by receiving the imperial crown and reestablishing the empire of the West, had acted after Napoleon's own heart and proved himself worthy of commemoration. It is curious to know when he first entertained this idea, it could scarcely have been before the night of Floreal of the year 11, April 29th, 1803, when it is first mentioned in a note to the Minister of the Interior. The minister is to drop a plan for the erection of a statue of Charlemagne on the Place de la Concorde or on the Place called Vendôme. This exactly corresponds in date to the failure of the advances made to the pretender. The Count of Provence's letter to President Mayer was dated February 28th, and the royal princes declared their adhesion to it by April 23rd. Either the First Consul did not know the result of the Mayer affair and was preparing for the success of his negotiations, or he did not know it and was breaking ground. In either case, the idea dates from the advances made to the pretender. On the failure of these advances, Bonaparte relied more than ever on Charlemagne. This was proved by a solemn decree on the 8th of Vendemire of the year 12, October 1st, 1803. A column is to be erected in Paris in the middle of the Place saint -Dôme. Like that of Trajan, it is to be 2.73 meters in diameter and 20.78 in height. Trajan's column is 3.6 by 29.6 meters. The shaft is to be adorned spirally with 108 
allegorical bronze figures, each 97 centimeters high, representing the departments of the Republic. This is to be surmounted by a domed pedestal ornamented with olive leaves and supporting an erect statue of Charlemagne. There may be in this a reminiscence of the erection of a national column on the Place de la Concorde and the departmental columns in every chief town, which was decreed in the year 8, but it is of little significance. The principal and most deliberately significant detail tale of the new column was the statue of Charlemagne. What statue actually was it? A new one. Or the statue which had been brought from Ghent to Paris? On the 12th of Antibier, October 5th, four days after the decree, the Minister of the Interior refused to return the statue, which had been demanded by Kutkin, the mayor, to the city of Ghent. Since a use has been found for the statue of Charlemagne, he wrote, it is impossible to return it to Ghent. Or was it another bronze statue carried off to Paris in 1794 from the Great Fountain in the square before the town hall at aix la chapelle and preserved in the National Library? This statue the minister refused at the same time to return to the people of Aix, whichever one it might have been. The intention was obvious and remarkable. Napoleon intended to claim Charlemagne as his ancestor. He was perhaps first drawn towards that monarch in his youth by the legendary tales of which Lucian sang in his surname. He certainly applied many passages of the Ave of Manly's observations on the history of France, which he had studied at Auxonne, to his own destiny, so that they seemed almost prophetic. This was the fountainhead of his ideas, but he engaged someone, probably Fontaine, to supply details, suggest parallels, and furnish hints, usually incorrect, long before the passing of the Senatus Consultum at St. Cloud, by which the people had been summoned to vote upon the question of a hereditary government Napoleon had pondered in his mind over most of the titles and outward dignities with which he intended to load and infest himself. Here, too, the fascination of Charlemagne is beyond dispute. An emperor himself, his grandiose nature, determined to pass over unnoticed the third dynasty and revive the glory of the second. Louis the Sixteenth had been so often declared to be the last king of France, even by those who offered the crown to Napoleon, that he thought it inexpedient to gainsay it. The Republic, as maintained by the Senatus Consultum, was very willing to merge its name into that of the Empire, except upon the coinage. An emperor over a Republic is not an utter incongruity. By that appellation, he became the equal of the emperors of Germany and Russia, who would not themselves have taken the title king, unless, indeed, essentially Carlovingian, but the titles bestowed upon the great dignitaries who surrounded the imperial throne were so and Germanic to boot. From the beginning of his reign, Napoleon determined to bestow crowns after the manner of those born by the electors. Thus he created an arch-chancellor of the empire, such as the elector of Mayence, and an arch-chancellor of states, such as the elector of Treves was, and an arch-treasurer and was also the elector of Mayence, but he preferred the purely French title of constable to that of high marshal, which might have offended the 12 peers of the new Charlemagne, who had been made marshals of the empire. He borrowed to from the ancient France the name of Grand Admiral, for the dignity was unknown in the German empire. He dispensed with a high butler, high steward, and high chamberlain for these titles implied personal service and the holders of the great were only to perform political duties, but he kept the title of Grand Elector, which had hitherto been unknown in France, to the great officers of the crown. He gave titles, which were customary in every court of Europe, as well as in France, only substituting the German Grand Marshal for the French Grand Master. As to the Grand Officers of the Empire, whose dignities were purely honorary, the titles they held were, for historic reasons, alien to Germany, and perforce borrowed from old France. But the scheme was still, in its essentials, a German importation. <laughs>